I think I will now pass it on to Professor Olivier to get the masterclass started. Okay, thank you, Annika. Thank you, Sabrine. Thank you, the old HEC team in Qatar. And I'm super happy to be with you guys tonight, especially with the region, Middle East region and Qatar more specifically, because I'm based in Paris. And as you know, travel is still difficult uh, right now with the COVID situation, and that's a great opportunity to interact with you all. So I'm going to be speaking on my own first, but uh, hopefully we're going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. I'm going to be very happy to interact with you. I'm going to be joined with two of our HEC alumni in Qatar, Mohamed El Jeffari, who is a PhD student whose focus is on uh, innovation in uh, Islamic fintech, and also Mohamed Al Belaimi, who is the founder of Skip Cash. And I wanted to have those uh, two great leaders from the Qatari region with me tonight because my expertise is more academic and they're going to be able to answer your questions as well if it pertains more to more regional, more specific questions about fintech, blockchain, and the fintech ecosystem more generally in Qatar. All right, so I guess it's time to make a start. My name so is Olivier Bossard. I'm 53 year old. Just to give you a bit of background, because I think it's interesting to explain you why I'm so excited about the blockchain. I'm a professor of finance here, but originally I didn't study finance. I grew up as an engineer. I have an engineering degree from an engineering school in Paris, Ecole called Central Paris, and I studied the applied mathematics. I was super excited about that. At the time in the 1990s, Japan was a place to go if you wanted to go at the forefront of uh, mathematics applied to robotics. It was the beginning of artificial intelligence as well. So I went to Japan for three years to study neural networks and cryptography, something which I kept buried later on because I went to work in finance. And that's why I, I wanted to make this introduction because you're going to see 20 years later, I came back at the intersection of uh, cryptography, mathematics, and finance through the blockchain. So I worked for over two decades at the four investment banks. I've been working on uh, what you call financial markets on the trading floor, working on the trading structuring functions. I always love teaching. I'd been teaching at HEC since the year 2000. That's uh, 22 years now, in parallel to my career as a, as a banker. And I joined HEC permanently five years ago now in 2016. So I'm professor of finance. I teach courses mainly on the financial markets. And I'm co-responsible in Paris for Master of Finance, which is a one-year program where we take the students basically graduated from business school, from engineering schools. So typically around 23, 24 year old. And we give them a very comprehensive program over 12 months across all areas of finance, which covers corporate finance, uh, financial markets, and also fintech and new technologies like the blockchain. So this is just a bit of background. Maybe I could share my screen now, if you don't mind. So I prepared for you tonight a very, very basic slides which I'm going to complement later on. I'm going to send you as well. Sabrina is going to send to all attendees a much more, a much deeper content, about 100 pages, going more into the details. So during this one hour here, I'm just going to make a generic presentation. And later on, you can go more in depth into the details. I think first it's interesting to tell you about my personal journey, why and how I got interested in blockchain. As you might know, I'm going to explain you later on, Bitcoin was the first application case of this new technology called the blockchain. It's been developed in uh, October 2008. And I found out about it much later in 2013. So five years later, I was a bit late. Uh, firstly, I was curious about it because I studied cryptography, as I said earlier, and I found an application of cryptography in finance. And this concept of virtual money, firstly, I was, hmm, what the hell is that? It's, it, I was very skeptical, like a lot of people at the time. It's a new weird idea from libertarians who think about free money, et cetera. And the more I studied the subject, the more I became really honestly subjugated about how intellectually challenging it was, how complex it was. So in a nutshell, how I would describe this technology, firstly, it's extremely simple in principle. And here today, I'm just going to talk about the principle. Extremely simple, but to make it work, it is 
absolutely extremely complex. You have no idea of the amount of algorithm of uh, complex mathematics there is behind this technology. And I try to keep ahead of the new developments, but I would not pretend in any way I'm an expert of this technology. It requires a few hours of work every day just to keep up to date with new development. So it's complex technology, difficult to understand in depth if you want to be a programmer. But what I'm going to try to do today is to give you some broad ideas to work around it, okay? To figure out what sort of applications you can build upon this technology and what you can do with the appropriate support in terms of programmers and researchers. I think as well, it's an educational challenge because my main work is to kind of decomplexify complex things. And it's true that this technology is a bit complex at first. So big challenge ahead of us, but hopefully in 50 minutes, you're, you're going to have a clear view about what it's all about. An analogy I find interesting to make is what happened with the digitization of information 30 years ago. Now we're having the very same thing with digitization of money. Okay. So 30 years ago, I was a 20-year-old uh, student geek. I was all excited about those things, about email, for example. When I was in Japan, my first email I wrote to a friend working uh, for, for the French embassy in Washington. Well, I had to write my email in a specific format. I had to compile it. I had to send it through three different servers. It took about 48 hours for my email to move from Japan, Tokyo, to Washington in the US, OK? And at the time, there were some appearance of World Wide Web, which existed already since the 80s, but which became really public in the 90s. And the start of the web, you might remember, it was very difficult at the beginning to have an email address. I was one of the 3,000 people in Japan. We were lucky to have one email address, OK? And now I guess you have several email. I have maybe three, four, five email addresses, one at HEC, a personal one, one to do online shopping. I don't want to be spammed on my personal one. So I have a third one and maybe a fourth one for my family. So right now you can have multiple email addresses. At the time, it was not possible. Why? Because technologists invented this so-called multi-layering technology that allowed the web to develop really exponentially. Okay. And now where are we? 30 years later, after the 1990s, everything is digital, okay? I'm in Paris, you guys are in Qatar. We exchange not just information, but videos, slides, voice, recording, real time. I can communicate with my daughter who's studying in the UK through WhatsApp, exchange photos, exchange messages for free real time. When I was 20 years old, I was buying DVDs for my favorite movies. My kids don't buy DVDs. You can see them online on streaming through platforms like Netflix. I used to have CDs of my favorite rock groups, Beatles, etc. Now, I guess you don't buy CDs anymore. You subscribe to Spotify or Apple Music. So all the information, which was physical 30 years ago, has now moved to digital information. And What's happening right now with money, with this blockchain technology, we are at the very start of the same thing happening to money. Money is becoming digital, okay? And we are still in the middle of this line. It's still a chaotic beginning. People get excited about Bitcoin. I always tell them oh, Bitcoin in 20, 30 years time is going to be worth probably zero because the adoption rate is very slow because Bitcoin is consuming a lot of energy. But we are at the start of this new concept of making money digital. And to really understand the main concept is that if I want to share information today, for example, I'm gonna send you all, I'm gonna send Sabrina at the end of this conversation, a PDF of this, presentation. And Sabrina is going to send it to all our guests today. You're all going to have the same file. Who's the real owner of the file? We're all going to have the same PDF, the same PowerPoint file. So it's been duplicated many times. And that's good. We want duplication of information. With money, it's different though. If I need to pay 10 euros to Sabrina, 
And if Sabrina is giving this 10 euros to someone else, we don't want this money to be duplicated, of course. We just want one unit of money to be moving from my portfolio, from my pocket to Sabrina or to someone else. So making money digital is a very different concept from making information digital because you want the money not to be replicable. So this is a main challenge the blockchain technology is trying to address. Okay. Maybe before we start, I think it's interesting to make a step back and a big step back several thousand years ago to understand what is the concept of money. What is money trying to achieve? And in my finance courses, we say that money has three attributes. It's an intermediary of exchange. We want to exchange goods. We want to exchange services. And money allows that. Money is also a unit of account. We count the value of one Big Mac, the value of a car, the value of a barrel of oil, the value of an apartment, the value of a house with a certain number, number of euros, of dollars, or whatever. So money is a unit of account. And ultimately, money is also a store value. You want to keep money for your retirement. You want to keep money to raise your children. So money has to be a store value. So these are the three attributes of money. And the reason why I'm insisting on that is that you're going to see we are trying with the blockchain technology to replicate those three attributes. And if I get back to the very old time, the prehistoric age, we didn't have money. So men were exchanging goods with barter. For example, I had chicken, you had goats, you had cows, and a farmer could exchange five chicken against one goat and three goats against one cow. So barter was a way of exchanging goods and barter was also a way of having a unit of account. We had exchange rate. A five chicken equal one goat, three goats equal one cow. We are missing the third attribute though, store of value. Because of course, if you keep a chicken for one year, two years, in a box, in a cage, the chicken is gonna die. So you cannot keep goods forever. Same for bananas, for carrots, for apples. They're gonna rot, they're gonna petrify, they're gonna die. So barter was not a way of having the third attribute, store value, okay? Shells was a way of making representation of goods in a sense that shells, you could not falsify them and they were long lasting unless they broke. And we found actually shells in the mountainous regions in Central Europe, miles, miles away from the sea because people in prehistoric times could use query shells or pearly shells as a way of exchanging money. But people living next to the sea could get a lot of shells. So we needed something which has another attribute, which had some intrinsic value and you could not find so easily. And that's where we moved to precious metals. So around 700 to 500 before Christ, we had the first gold coins. Okay, here you see a Roman coins in gold, on gold, in electrum, in platinum. Why precious metals? Because those metals, they cannot disappear. They cannot petrify, they cannot oxide. You can keep them in a chest, you can bury them for thousands of years. Gold is still going to be here. And guess what? With gold, you can make some nice wedding rings. You can make some nice jewels for princesses, for your wife. Gold is still going to have some intrinsic value. In addition, we tried to standardize it. So we tried to make the weight of all the gold coins the same or similar. And we started as well to prove the value of this money by stamping the money. So in old gold coins from the Greeks, from the Romans, from the Chinese as well, you had the head or the seal of an emperor printed on it. And that's where we moved to something really different, what we call fiduciary money. Fiduciary money, for those who are not familiar with this adjective, fiduciary, fiduciary in English means simply based on trust. So we moved to the concept of money, which was not intrinsic, not the value of the gold itself with which you can design jewels, but representation of money. You trust this piece of paper 
So here you can see paper's first money from the Song Dynasty in China. It was around 10th century. In Europe, it appeared around the 17th century. In Sweden, the first paper money. And this money has absolutely no intrinsic value. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute now. Here's a 10 euro banknote and this is a five dollars banknote. What's the value of this? Intrinsic value? It's pretty much nothing, okay? See a piece of paper, same size, okay? What's the value of paper? Paper is very cheap to produce, right? So what makes this one worth a lot more? There's color on it, there's some metal part here. What makes this value is simply those three letters here, ECB. European Central Bank. This money is granted by a central bank. That's what makes it worth something in my mind. I know that the European Central Bank is making this piece of money valuable. Similarly, this piece of money, same size. Okay, this is worth absolutely nothing, right? This is worth some money because you can see here it's signed by the treasurer of the Federal Reserve in the US. And I trust the European Central Bank. I trust them that with 10 euros right now, I can buy myself a nice meal, a nice sandwich, a nice meal at McDonald's. And in five years time, with this, I can still buy myself a nice Big Mac meal at McDonald's, or maybe not, maybe because there's gonna be inflation. Oh, inflation can be a problem. So maybe because of inflation in 10 years time, I can only buy a small sandwich, or maybe I can just buy a Coca-Cola with this 10 euro note. But still, I trust my central bank. SNCU Aid Talk is telling us it's costing three cents to produce $100 bill. Thank you, Aid, for this uh, precision. So the cost of producing paper is absolutely nothing. I trust this has some value. And my friends in the US as well, and you guys as well in Qatar, you trust your local currency. But it's not the same everywhere. Ask our friends from Venezuela. 500 bolivars used to be a lot of money. And then the economy of the country went a bit south. So they had to print a lot of money. So what was worth 500 bolivars? And two years later, you needed 1,000. And then you needed to print bigger money, like 2,000, like 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. There's been a lot of inflation. I can give you another example. You've heard about this country in Eastern Africa called Zimbabwe. In the mid 90s, it went through not just inflation, what we called uh, hyperinflation. And they started issuing $10 billion banknotes. And to the point where the money got completely delisted. These are real banknotes, by the way. I'm a billionaire, guys. Am I saying the Russian ruble crashed today? Yes, the Russian ruble crashed at least 30%, I think, over the past uh, four days. So, the concept of fiduciary money is based on trust. And as you can see in Zimbabwe, you cannot trust this money anymore. I buy them on Amazon. I give them to my students at HEC when they do well in the quiz. It's not worth anything anymore. So those people in the mid 90s, people called themselves libertarians. They said, okay, hey, we cannot always trust our central banks. Our friends in Venezuela and Zimbabwe cannot trust their central banks, but can we? in our modern world, in Qatar, in France, in the US, trust the central banks, maybe today, but we don't know in five, 10 years time. We need to have money, a way of exchange, a way of having a unit of account, a way of storing value independently of the central banks. And this is what blockchain technology is about to develop cryptocurrency. That's a main concept. So. This is a main concept libertarians behind this concept of blockchain have been trying to address. Let me reshare my screen now. Another important point related to that, yes, after the Second World War, we call the Bretton Woods Conference, all the exchange rates across the world, basically the dollar, was pegged to gold. This has changed later on in 1971 with President Nixon. The dollar was unpegged from the value of gold, and it was really becoming a fiduciary money. So this is what we have right now. Money is just granted and controlled by governments and central banks. Independently of that, another revolution of money, which we saw over the past 30 years, but which is actually much, much earlier, is about having money which is not physical, in the form of banknotes, in the form of coins, but scriptural, written 
on a ledger. Right now, HEC is not paying my salary, giving me banknotes or coins or gold. There's just a small line on my bank account that says, Olivier, today, 1st of March, you received your salary from HEC. Money has become scriptural, written on registers. So we all think this is new. Actually, this is not that new. The first scriptural money appeared in 18th century. The first credit card as well, Dino's Club credit card in the 1950s, was the first way of proving to someone you have some money on an account. And by showing this very nice card, at the time it was paper card, now it's plastic card, me, I'm worth some money I can pay for my bill at a restaurant by showing out this Dino's Club card. And we moved, as you know, for exchange in a complete electronic format with bank cards, with online payment system like Visa, like Apple Pay, where you simply exchange money in a digitized format. One specific point I'm putting on this slide, there is still a control body. There is still a bank behind this payment. There is still a central bank behind this currency, but it does not intervene directly. It's just me with my card in front of a pay point when I want to buy a newspaper, a piece of bread, or some oil for my car. But there is still a central bank. There is still a bank beyond. And then the last chapter of this evolution of money from physical barter to precious metals, to fiduciary money, to digitized money, is precisely this new revolution about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Here I'm putting the logos. There are many of them. The first one which really made an appearance was Bitcoin. And you see here the logo of Monero, Litecoin, Ripple, Ethereum, and so many of them. So what are cryptocurrencies? In a sense here, I'm putting the seven main attributes of cryptocurrencies. Firstly, and that's the most important point, they are dissociated of any central control body. It's a system which is run collectively by some participants in a network, call them the miners. There's no central authority. And therefore, you can see on the right-hand side of my slide, it cannot be grasped, it cannot be frozen by a central body. Secondly, it's a money which is completely abstract. There's no physical presence, but it is immutable, infallible, eternal. The idea that it's going to be here forever is going to retain its value. And the attributes on the right-hand side, you can see, the idea is that it can be transmitted anywhere in the world. For those of you who followed the news with what's happened in Ukraine, exchanging money outside of Ukraine has been difficult over the past four days. I could share with you the slides very interestingly about what's been happening with the transactions in Ukraine. Let me reshare. You can see here, this is the exchange trading volume since last week. It has almost doubled in Ukraine across Kuna, the main platform of cryptocurrencies in, in Ukraine. The volume of daily exchange almost doubled up. So it can be transmitted anywhere in the world and independently verified by anyone who received it. It's not based on trust. It's a system itself where everyone can have access to the ledger. So. Getting more into the theory, here I'm going to make a brief history. People think blockchain all started with Bitcoin. Actually, it started 10 years before Bitcoin. Bitcoin started in 2008. The first concept of digital money came from a mathematician called Ralph Merkel. Ralph Merkel had invented what he called the hash trees. It's a kind of a database system, but that allows independent confirmation. And this was as early as 1980s. Then you had Mr. Weidai, again, based on the West Coast, who invented this first concept, the B-Money. Here you can see a copy of his abstract. And then Nick Zabo invented the BitGold just before Bitcoin. BitGold was very similar to Bitcoin. The protocol was not as distributed as a Bitcoin. It still required a central authority. But the idea was that everyone could access still the ledger. And then came this Bitcoin, October 2008. There was this forum, many used by people who call themselves libertarians. They call themselves cypherpunks. It's a cipher as a crypto, as a ciphering, as a encoding messages, and punks, non-standard people. And those cypherpunks were extending on this forum called the cypherpunk forum about ways of 
getting out of the control of the governments. It started with uh, Julian Assange, for example, for information. And there are so many people like Nick Zabo, like Gavin Anderson, and this person called Satoshi Nakamoto. Actually, it was a pseudonym. Here I put a picture of a man very often associated with Satoshi Nakamoto. He's actually a different man. His pseudonym is Dorian Nakamoto, an engineer in the US. Abib is saying in the chat, yes, Satoshi's identity is unknown. Absolutely, absolutely. We do believe it's a Japanese name. Actually, looking at the exchanges on the cypherpunk system, this Mr. Nakamoto was always posting at times where in the West Coast time zone, so he was probably living in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego. Mr. Nakamoto could write in a, an immaculate, perfect English. So we have good reasons to believe that he was not Japanese, but more of a US person. And probably he realized his invention was going to put him in so great danger so great trouble that he decided to use this pseudonym and he wanted to remain completely anonymous. Asim is saying, what about the guy who won the case? Yes, there was a guy, an Austrian guy, maybe you know better than me, Asim, called Craig Wright. Craig Wright pretended he was Satoshi Nakamoto. Actually, we don't know. It could, it's more likely Craig Wright pretended he was Satoshi. We believe it's more a group of people. Gavin Anderson was very definitely one of them. Nick Zabo as well, a group of people. And in October 2008, this paper, you can see here a screenshot of the first page. If you go to the website 3w.bitcoin.org, you can find this white paper. It's just nine pages. And it's been published in, uh, I think, 47 languages. So you can find it in uh, Arabic, of course, in French, in so many languages. This white paper is just nine pages, very synthetic, very straight to the point. And here I put the quote that Satoshi put online, very simple phrase saying, I think I have solved a problem in computer science. I found a way to create an electronic money system, which is direct between people peer to peer. And I'm giving you the attached code elements so that you can implement this code on your computer and you can participate in this network to exchange money between all the people in this network. Dan Raj is saying, I read it and it is really straightforward. You're absolutely right, Dan Raj. Anyone interested, download this paper. I'm going to put on the chat 3w.bitcoin org you can download this nine pages pdf document in french in arabic in english whatever it's accessible to everyone the code in appendix i used to have it on my computer up to 2018 i could still run it on a fairly basic computer but the size of the network grew so much that i didn't have enough cpu to run it but it's a code readily available the code being participating in this network sharing information, having access to all the transactions is something anyone can do. It's not Mr. Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook having his own money. It's not the European Central Bank. It's not the Federal Reserve. It's a system where you can participate, you can see all the transactions, you can verify all the transactions. So that was in October 2008. Three months later, in January 2009, the system, all those cypherpunks, implemented the code of Satoshi, they realized they could exchange this token. So this token was just representing something, some value. And interestingly, Bitcoin is the name of the network, of the software, of the protocol, the algorithm. And Bitcoin is also the name of the token, which circulates through the system on which we associate some value. So we talk about the Bitcoin technology. And we talk as well about the value of the token itself called a Bitcoin. Safame is making a very interesting point. Satoshi disappeared. Absolutely. Satoshi did his first transaction. And then he said to one of the cypherpunks, the most interested in the technology, a guy called Gavin Anderson, he said, hey, Gavin, do you mind taking care of the system now? Do you mind if I put your email address on this Bitcoin system? And do you mind being my second man, my lieutenant? Gavin Anderson said, yes, I don't mind. That's cool. I'm happy to, Gavin was very involved in fine tuning the protocol, making it safer and more robust. So Gavin was already helping to develop the code of Satoshi. And then as a Safa thing in the chat, Satoshi disappeared. 
He did his first transaction. He did a couple of others and then didn't show up anymore on the Cypherpunk forum. We don't know where Satoshi is right now. Maybe he's retired in the Bahamas, very rich. Maybe he didn't want to use this money because his first transaction made him multi-billionaire. And we even don't know who is this guy. Anyway, this first transaction was done on January 2009 on this new system. So how this system works? I'm going to send you about 100 pages of presentation later on. In a nutshell, the system of this virtual money, it's not about a currency. It's about a software. It's about a protocol distributed where people share some computing power and jointly, they're going to agree on a transaction being valid. If Olivier today sends one token to Sabrina, people are going to witness this transaction and they're going to say, yes, we saw that. We agree with it. And those people, they're going to verify collectively. And one of them, the first one to verify the transaction, is going to add this new transaction. And once you have enough transactions, they're going to be put in a block and they're going to be chained like a blockchain, that's where the name comes from. And this transaction between Olivier and Sabrine for one Bitcoin or a fraction of Bitcoin, because you know Bitcoin is worth a lot of money, but you can trade into thousands of Bitcoin and thousands of thousands. We call this unit one Satoshi, actually. And this transaction for one Satoshi, five Satoshi, or one Bitcoin is going to be written forever in this distributed ledger. People know now that user A has given a certain number of tokens to user B. It has been validated, it has been secured based on this technology. So I'm going to send you much longer presentation where I explain more in details. There's a bit of math, there's a bit of algorithm, but I try to make it uh, simple words to understand how practically it works. The main concept here again, I want to, before we move further, the three main points. There is no physical form. It's a currency which is not physical. It's all electronic and there's no central authority. It operates without people controlling. The code has been written by Satoshi nine years ago. The code is still improved regularly. The miners as a Bitcoin community, regularly they decide on improving the security of the protocol. The blockchain operates without central authority without any control. The algorithm is immutable. It's not going to change unless the miners jointly agree. And that's where we have this system of forking into the system where people might disagree on which is the best way of improving the protocol. For those who are familiar, another crypto system called Ethereum, there's been a major disagreement some uh, five years ago now. And there's been a forking where people said, okay, no, I think we should do it a certain way. Other people said we should do it in a different way. But apart from those forking cases, the protocol is immutable. It's going to stay forever. And we all know how it works. It's not like a central bank can decide we're going to put pressure on the Russia and therefore the robot is going to collapse or the economy of Venezuela or the economy of Turkey is doing so bad that the value of their currency is going to go down or there's going to be super high inflation. Here as well, the quantity of Bitcoin issued as a cap, like for gold, we know that the quantity of gold which we can dig from Earth has a certain limit. Similarly, when Satoshi created the algorithm protocol for Bitcoin, he said 21 million Bitcoin is the limit of issuance. So it's completely immutable. So it's not dissimilar from Visa, from Apple Pay, for all the system of digitized money. Again, I want to restate the fact that this money is independent from any central authority. This money can be used everywhere across the world. And, and this means you can communicate, you can exchange money throughout the world without any censorship. And when the same thing happened to information, People were very skeptical and petrified and scared about that. People said, okay, well, if you can exchange information, you allow people to exchange bad information. You allow terrorists to exchange information. You allow people to do drug traffic. You allow pornographers to, to develop some scary pictures or videos, etc." So just communicating without borders 30 years ago was something a bit scary. Well, exchanging money throughout the world can be perceived as scary. Of course, by exchanging freely money, you allow for terrorism. You allow for drug traffic. 
but those things would happen anyway with a traditional money. The main concept is that still this concept of cryptocurrencies, we want to allow to transcend the borders to allow anyone anywhere to trade outside of the control of the nation state. And that's what makes central banks so scared about this new technology. You've seen the way the US government and the Federal Reserve tried to stop Mark Zuckerberg. You saw the way China decided to stop the mining and the investment in uh, cryptocurrencies, even in Europe. Firstly, we were all excited about this new buzz and you see central banks trying to develop their own cryptocurrencies as well. So this is really a very disruptive technology. This slide for me is as well super important. Everyone is excited about blockchain, but you don't need blockchain for everything. I'm putting here three tick boxes on the right side and on the left side to make you understand when you need a blockchain and when you need just a simple database. You need a blockchain if you want to have no centralized control. If you want to have an admin control of your system, well, you don't need a blockchain, you just need a simple database. If you want a permission-based system, you need a database, not a blockchain. If you want to be able to change the value, if you don't want this immutability, then you need a database, not a blockchain. So for me, when I'm consulted by people who are interested in FinTech and say, hey, we want to develop a super cool blockchain to develop our new brand of uh, whatever clauses or new system or gaming or those NFTs, those uh, non-fungible tokens. Well, if it's controlled, you don't need a blockchain. It's simply a database. Okay, so a lot of people think, okay, use this buzzword, but just be careful. A blockchain, you need a blockchain, you want a blockchain only when you want no centralized control, public access, and immutability. These are the three attributes you should keep in mind. So beyond this system of cryptocurrencies, which we can talk further about, the emergence of Bitcoin and the others, I want to make you as well understand it's going to be a revolution not just for exchanging money, but as well, many other applications. And just to finish up, I just have 10 minutes before the q and I'm just going to give you three fields of application. Property records, supply chain, and medical records. Why is it so interesting to have this technology? Imagine a system where your register, your identity, your nationality, your title deeds, can be preserved in a distributed way and in an unforgeable way. You have no idea about the amount of migrants that travel by faking passports. You have countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where people are removed from their identity. They don't even have title deeds. With such a register, completely immutable, preserved, whatever the dictator, whatever the country you live in, it will be preserved. This is one application of the blockchain technology. It's not just a dream. It's happening. I give you here two examples. GovCoin. You can go to the website of the UK Department of Work and Pensions. The UK Pension Ministry is working on this system, GovCoin, where all your history of employment in the UK would be decentralized put in this blockchain by all your employers. So when you get to your retirement age at 60, 65 years old, the government can have access to all your salaries or all your pension slips and know how much you've contributed to get your pension from the state. Another example, the company Ericsson is helping the Estonian government to have all the taxes system put on a blockchain technology so that whether it's income taxes or real estate taxes or sort of taxes, can be put on this technology. Another application which is much easier to understand is the supply chain, the traceability of goods. For example, in the agri-food industry, you're going to have calls coming from a certain farm. They're going to be raised in a farm. They're going to go to a slaughterhouse. They're going to be processed into meat, into a factory. They're going to go to a distributor and then to a shop, to a butcher shop and or to a supermarket. There's been a lot of severe cases of food contamination with the blockchain technology, independently of all the companies involved in this system, we could trace where the food comes from, from which butcher factory, from which slaughterhouse, from which farm, from which animal. And if you have an incident of food 
the same for drugs as well, or any industrial product being contaminated, you can trace all the history. This is already a reality. You might have heard about Reliance Industries. Reliance Industries is the biggest conglomerate in India. Reliance Industries, which operates in many, many different areas of industry, chemistry, pharmaceutical industry, heavy industry, they develop their own blockchain, Geocoin. So you might say, okay, it's private. Yes, it's private, but across different companies within the same conglomerate reliance industries. And all their supply chain is managed right now with this so-called Geocoin. You can go on their website. It's very interesting the way they explain it. Another example, I'm going to finish with this one, medical records. Say I go to my doctor in Paris and maybe my doctor thinks, okay, there's something not really satisfactory in my check and he wants me to do a blood sample, to do a blood test. Okay, I'm going to go to a specific laboratory, do a blood test. And then let's say I have a car accident. I do want the emergency services to know everything about my blood history. That's super important for the emergency services to know what's happening with my blood, to have access to everything. So having a distributed record about all my health is super interesting. At the same time, when I go back to my doctor, when I go to my pharmacist, I don't want my pharmacist to know that I have very severe medical situation that have cancer, maybe it's too embarrassing for me. So we can create with this blockchain technology, medical records which are distributed, but still with different levels of security. So having a secure prescription of drugs, but at the same time, having some different levels of privacy. I don't want my pharmacist to know everything about my health, but if I'm run over in a car accident, I want the people who are gonna save my life to know everything about what happened, my history, the medicine I take, etc. The blockchain technology allows us to have those different levels of protection and still some distributed information. And here I put two very interesting examples. You can have a look again on the web. I could send you the links. Medrec, which is a product from the MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Simply Vital Health, which has developed two very interesting products, Connecting Care and Health Nexus where effectively records can be distributed, but with different levels of security. One last example I want to share with you guys, which is much less developed right now, but very promising. People very often think, okay, well, that's cool, Professor Olivier, this is nice, but again, this is only gonna help developed countries. Qatar is gonna benefit from the blockchain technology, France and the US, etc., and actually not. Actually, this technology is going to allow as well underdeveloped countries to have access to banking system. Typical example is Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa below Sahara is more than 1 billion people. How many people in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to a bank account, to a bank? Just a quarter of them, 24% right now. This is a number from December 2021. Why? Because banks are not everywhere, because Africa is a very, very vast land, because there are some parts of Africa or Central Africa or of Ivory Coast where you need to travel 100 kilometers to get to a bank and you don't have the communication systems and people do not write. They don't know how to write, how to read. Maybe in some countries where there are some wars, some conflicts, people are deprived from identity. They don't have identity certificates, so they cannot open a bank account. So Africa, unfortunately, is a land where only a quarter of the people have access to a bank account. But guess what? 81% of this population, they own a mobile phone. So maybe it's not a very cool iPhone like I do have, like many of you guys have. It's very unsophisticated, but 81% of those 1 billion people do have a mobile phone. And guess what? With mobile phone, we can create some virtual money. So it's not based on blockchain. So I'm I'm making a small appendix here, but you might have heard about this system, for example, in Kenya called M-Pesa, M-P-E-S-A. 87% of the people in Kenya, a very undeveloped countries, used M-Pesa system to do online payments. It's not for the very rich, it's for the poor people. If you want to buy one fish, one bag of rice, one kilogram of rice, you can do it through this mobile technology, exchanging money virtually through M-Pesa. Sagentia and Zantel is doing the same in uh, Tanzania. So this is one area 
just to show you, even before the blockchain technology, because now we have blockchain technology making those systems even more waterproof. Right now, m for example, is backed by Vodafone, the UK mobile company. So it's not distributed. It could be said it's opaque and it could be broken. But the blockchain technology now is putting an extra layer of security on this. And similarly, Yunus, the underdeveloped world, since uh, Mohamed Yunus in Bangladesh, is getting developed through the system of microfinance and crowdfunding. Well, microfinance can be administered in a very effective way through the blockchain technology. So for me, this slide is very important as well, because I often hear people saying, okay, well, this is just an intellectual concept that are going to help against the very rich and the big banks and the big systems. No, this new technology is here as well to help the underserved and the underdeveloped people in a way where they can exchange money outside of the central banks, outside of potentially countries where you're going to have trouble with your money, with your own currency, like Zimbabwe, as I said earlier. So where are we going from now? People get scared about the safety of blockchains. What is at risk right now? You've heard about a lot of hacks. Hacks are more about the platforms where you're going to log in because platforms online can be hacked. But having your money, your crypto money on a hot, what you call a hot wallet online is like leaving your money in the supermarket. You know, what you need to do, you need to have, I don't know if you can see, I have a crypto wallet like this. This is a ledger wallet where you can put all your money outside of the internet. You keep it with you. It's what you call a cold wallet, completely disconnected from internet. So crypto monies are non there's been a few cases in the past, but they've been corrected on Ethereum, on a few other chains. Crypto money cannot be hacked. Another problem, another criticism of cryptocurrencies is the lack of scalability, specifically the proof of work system on which Bitcoin is based. I don't have time to explain this. Now, there are two main technologies behind cryptocurrencies, proof of work and proof of scale. Proof of work to be a miner, to be involved in the Bitcoin protocol, you need to consume a lot of energy to resolve some algorithm to effectively prove that you've been active in verifying the transaction. And this is costing a lot of hash power, a lot of computer power. And therefore, this is costing a lot in electricity. You might have heard those crazy numbers that the Bitcoin system needs as much electricity as a country like Denmark or Israel to run. So Bitcoin right now, everyone is getting excited. Sorry, Bitcoin for me is doomed to fail. It's lacking scalability. But new technologies are emerging. For example, Ethereum is based on, and Peercoin as well, is based on a new system called proof of stake. The fact that the miners, the people verifying the validity of the transaction do own a large quantity of coins makes their verification much more reliable because those guys would not screw up transactions because they have a stake in the system. So they would lose this stake if they valid incorrect transactions. And then you have also those uh, so-called hybrid methods. You might have heard about those uh, cryptocurrency. I'm giving a few names here, like uh, EOS, Cardano, Raiden Network, which are similar to what you have with the internet with a multi-layering system. By having multi-layers, it allows miners effectively to verify transactions without having to go through all this intense mining work. And then on this, you can build as well, not just values for token, but you can build information. That's what Ethereum is allowing you to do. So on Ethereum, you can have tokens associated not just with a value, but with a specific attribute. This attribute can be a contract. This attribute can be an image. You've heard about all this crazy buzz around uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, those digital images which you would own through this Ethereum contract. So this second generation of cryptocurrencies allow as well to have not just value, but to have also goods, digital goods associated with the exchange of tokens. And this opens a lot of applications. Think money, because money is physical. Money is only owned by human beings, right? I own some money. You guys own some money. With this virtual money, you could have cryptocurrencies associated not to an individual, but to a machine, to an AI. Think, for example, insurance contracts for a car. Instead of having the insurance contract related to the owner, the car itself 
could have a contract associated with its insurance. We would have tokens associated to the oil we're using. Or think about other applications like title deeds associated with a property. You could assign to this property the consumption of electricity or gas, etc., independently of who is the physical owner of the property. So you could have effectively machines, computers owning those virtual currencies, not having human beings behind, not having companies behind. That opens from a pure philosophical perspective, that opens a lot, a lot of uh, interesting ventures around AI really could artificial systems like uh, computers, artificial intelligence could effectively own money and could effectively participate into this big exchange without having always a human intervention, without having a bank account associated with human beings. If you want to read more, I'm going to give you as well some very interesting books about people, not necessarily technicians, but people more visionary people explaining us all the applications we could make with this technology. And it's really opening a lot of fields of applications. And when people tell me, okay, well, that's cool. So I should invest in Bitcoin. I say, no, don't be foolish. Bitcoin is just a starting point. Like you might have seen the plane of the Wright brothers, or you might have seen the telephone of Graham Bell. No one is using the telephone of Mr. Bell anymore. But thanks to his invention now, we have iPhones, we have Nokias, we have Samsung super cool telephones. Similarly, the first plane of the Wright brothers, they could only fly a few kilometers. But thanks to this first invention, now we've got Airbus, we've got Boeing flying planes across the planet. So similarly, people get excited, get wrongly excited about cryptocurrencies, about blockchain, about being a new investment vehicle. For me, that's the wrong approach because I'm professor of finance. I'm here to train my students to put value on things, value on a stock, value on a company. How do I value Bitcoin? I don't know. What makes the price of a stock worth? It's a supply and demand, right? Where is the supply and demand for Bitcoin? Well, 82% of Bitcoin is owned by just 2% of the people involved in it. The concentration of people active into the Bitcoin network is the founders of Bitcoin. It's Mr. Nakamoto, it's all those guys having a huge, huge stake in Bitcoin, and they can make the price up or down. Bitcoin is not established. I don't buy my espresso, I don't pay my sandwich with Bitcoin. So right now, there's no natural supply and demand, there's no market equilibrium that allows me to say, well, the value of Bitcoin should be $100,000 or just $10,000. It's only a fledging technology today. It's a new technology, which has a lot of application, but still, right now, Bitcoin is not used every day. Every day, we still use a euro, we still use a dollar, but Bitcoin is not used on a day-to-day -day basis. So people will think, hey, that's a cool technology. Yes, that's a cool technology. Should you invest in it? Yes, you can. Can you get rich with Bitcoin? Of course you can. Maybe Bitcoin is going to double up, go above $100,000, but for me, Bitcoin could as well go to zero. So be very careful. I'm super excited, not just as an academic, as a human being, I'm super excited about the application of cryptocurrencies, about blockchain. But does it mean you should get super excited about rushing, opening an account online and buying cryptocurrencies? No. Invest in education. Invest in understanding the way it works. Invest in understanding what you can do for your businesses outside of cryptos for, as I said, supply chain, medical records, etc. Invest in understanding how you can use this technology. But don't put your money, your savings into things. So this is a presentation. It's quite heavy. It's a big PDF. First one is 37 pages and the second one is about 70. So this first presentation, I'm explaining more in detail. So it's a bit technical. So you need to roll up your sleeves. You're going to need to spend maybe a few hours reading through it, where I explain more how this system works. I explain about the history. I explain about how it differs from normal database. And I try to make it with a lot of illustrations so that even if you're not much into IT, you're going to understand how it works. My second presentation is going to be more into cryptos. So this one is about the crypto ecosystem. Everyone talks about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is just one of them. You have Ethereum, you've got all those alternative coins. You have the crypto exchanges, those platforms online where you can exchange uh, cryptocurrencies. And you have as well what you call central bank cryptocurrencies, which is central banks 
trying to have their system. So it is centralized because it's controlled by the central banks, but they try to use the blockchain technology in order to have a flow of money now independently of banks. So they're trying not to have banks, investment banks, commercial banks involved into the distribution of money because central banks realized when they tried to effectively make an impact on the economy, lending money to the banks doesn't mean necessarily the banks are going to be lending money to small people like you and me. So by doing this central banks control money, they try to control better effectively the efficiency of their system. So this is a much longer presentation I'm going to be sharing with you talking about old system like PayPal, for example, system like Bitcoin, of course explaining more about this proof of work, proof of stake system, explaining this forking methodology I just briefly explained, explaining where the attitude of different countries vis-a-vis -vis cryptocurrencies. Ethereum, which for me is a much more powerful technology than Bitcoin, but still has a lot of drawbacks, a lot of limitation in terms of speed of quantity of transaction you can put on Ethereum. And differences, similarities and differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. I talk a lot about Ethereum, about the smart contract DAO, the DAO system, how the hack happened on Ethereum, and then all those crypto exchanges. So here I'm using just a few examples like Coinbase, Kraken, Bitfinex, there are many others, Montgomery, which was completely hacked in Japan some years ago. The case of Montgomery is quite interesting, you know, 2014. And then cases like the Petro that was used in Venezuela and other projects like Ubin. And of course, other systems like Litecoin, Yota, Ripple, etc. So I'm going to be happy to share that. We don't have time to go through everything, but hopefully what I'm hoping to get today is get you excited about this theme because there are, as I said, a lot of applications, not just in finance. I don't know the background of all the audience right now. We've got a lot of people, but I presume a lot of you are not working in finance, but still, I'm definitely convinced that a lot of you, not tomorrow, but in the next 10 years or 20 years, you're going to be seeing application of this blockchain technology in those different industrial fields, in supply chain, in business management, records, etc. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say, but the idea is also to have an open dialogue with all of you. And maybe it's time as well for me to introduce my guest speakers. We have Mohamed al Jafari, who is a PhD student focusing on innovation, specifically Islamic fintech, and Mohamed al Delaimi, who is the founder of Skipcash. Sabrine, if you want to introduce our guest, they have a much more expertise of the local finance and fintech ecosystem in the Middle East region and Qatar more specifically, so they're going to be happy to help me answer. Thank you, Professor. They're actually now panelists, so they're, they will be able to answer the questions as well. So if you'd like to just click on the Q&A box, Professor, you'll be able to start seeing the questions sure. uh, that the audience has included throughout the presentation. Okay. Kamlesh is saying, I would like to know about how would we use cryptocurrencies to sell services or products? For example, my capstone is about selling products using crypto. What do I need to accomplish this? concept and go about making this happen. Okay. So Kamlesh, well, you're making a very relevant question. The issue is right now, it's not just about creating a cryptocurrency. It's about having people buy into the system. We all buy into the dollar because we all believe into the dollar. So we're all using dollar to buy holidays, to buy iPhone, to buy goods, to buy services. Kamlesh is asking, how would we use cryptocurrencies to sell services or products? Well, right now, the adoption rate is fairly limited. Practically speaking, what you can do, you go through an exchange. So you go through an exchange like Coinbase, for example. I was introducing a few of them. But you need your counterparts as well. People who are going to buy your goods to log into this exchange and to open up an account. You do have uh, several exchanges. I don't know specifically in Qatar. But through those exchanges, you can sell goods using cryptocurrencies. Yasmin is asking, is cryptocurrency the same as digital currency? Not exactly. Digital currency, Yasmin, is money which is exchanged digitally in electronic format. So when I use my SOCGEN credit card here, I use digital currency. This money is not physical. It's not a coin. It's not a banknote. This is digital currency. So digital currency is much broader. And as I said, it started in the 1950s with a dinos card. Cryptocurrency is money which is encrypted in order to have it distributed, to have it away from a central authority. 
I hope I answered your question, Yasmin. Alexander is asking any coins that you find interesting. Yes, Alexander. There are two which I recommend you look at. One, of course, is Ethereum. Ethereum allows to have a new dimension to attach information to the token, what we call smart contract. So when you exchange a token on Ethereum, it's not just a certain number of units, a certain currency, a certain monetary value. It's also a contract. So this contract can be information. This contract can be a property deed. If I want to sell my car or my house, I could do it through this type of smart contract. If I want to sell a property which is not physical, like a painting, but a digital painting, a numerical image, a series of pixels, I can transfer the ownership through the smart contract. So for this reason, I believe SRM is something very interesting. And as I said as well, from a pure technical perspective, there are two which I find very interesting. Peercoin, which is in the proof of stake method, I said earlier, and also this third generation, this multi-layer generation, EOS, Cardano, and Radon Network. Bahig is asking if the country started to develop their local cryptocurrencies, if this can let the current ones disappear. Bahig is making a very good point. So that's what Venezuela has been trying to do with the Petro. Venezuela said, okay, well, we're just fed up with our exchange rate deteriorating day and day and day against the dollar. So we're going to have this cryptocurrency, which is Petro, which is linked to the value of the dollar independently of our own currency. The problem is the adoption rate. Do people buy into that, firstly? And secondly, who is administering this local crypto? Because if it's administered by a country, it means you have intervention. Maybe it's not called a central bank. Maybe it's not directly the government, but you still have some controlling body. And precisely the idea behind cryptocurrency is to be away from any controlling body, be away from politicians that could become dictators, be away from central banks that could intervene and make interest rates up and down, and therefore your exchange rate against other currencies up or down. So your question, Baig, is very relevant. Yes, countries are trying to develop their local currencies, but that's the wrong approach for me. If you want to use something alternative to central bank, you need really to make it completely independent, not controlled by government, not controlled by Ministry of Economy or Finance. Lola is asking, is it only fashion trend? There's a lot of buzz around blockchain and crypto. I cannot count the number of uh, LinkedIn connection of people who say they are experts of uh, blockchain and crypto. I, I don't put this on my LinkedIn account. I say I'm interested about blockchain and crypto, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. For me, it's much more than a fashion trend. There's a lot of fashion trend, a lot of applications which are just absolutely crazy. You've seen those NFTs, those images about monkeys that sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars or the pictures of the footballers, digital pictures of footballers being sold for tens of thousands of dollars. This is just buzz, okay. So yes, there is a lot of fashion behind this, but the technology for me is a very robust technology, which is going to see a lot of application. Mohamed is asking, any recommendation for safe wallet provider? Well, I don't want to be advertising, but definitely for me, Ledger, I'm going to show my Ledger wallet here. Ledger is definitely a robust one. This is prior version, the nano version, but Ledger is making very robust wallets, which are encrypted, which I have double encryption and only me can use it. Dan Raj is saying, I do not trust Bitcoin because during the lockdown, there was too much people promoting it. I saw influencers, social media people, and even posts on making the product promotion. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Dan Raj. I got a lot of people upset. There was an article I wrote for Bloomberg Magazine in Hong Kong two years ago. You can find it on my LinkedIn profile. I put a copy of the article. And the title of the article said, for me, Bitcoin is going to go to zero. You can't imagine the number of people really upset at me saying, Olivier, you're a professor of finance. Please don't say that. Please don't say that Bitcoin is going to go to zero. I agree with you, Dan Raj. People are promoting Bitcoin for wrong reasons. People are pushing the price of Bitcoin up and down so easily because I said 80% of the Bitcoin is owned by just 2% of the owners. So Bitcoin technology for me is a revolution. It's something so interesting, so fascinating. But can you trust the system alone? No, because it's not adopted yet. So before it's adopted by the majority, by you and me, there cannot be any equilibrium price, which is a fair price. 
Fabrice Frédéric is asking, Mr. Olivier mentioned that this whole crypto world is quite disruptive, but we can also see that cryptocurrencies are highly volatile. You're, you're right, Fabrice. In this case, how can we trust that the future finance will be associated with cryptos when there is omnipresent high volatility? Okay, there is high volatility because there is no consensus on which one to use and if we should use them. So of course, price moves so easily up and down. You just need a few buyers or a few sellers to move the price a lot. The day where all of us, the day where the 1 billion people in Africa use the same cryptocurrency, volatility will disappear because there's going to be a higher adoption rate. So volatility is just due to the lack of adoption. As you rightly say, Fabrice, for now, they are too volatile. They are not adopted yet. Is there much volatility on the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar? No, because they're adopted by a lot of people. So we need a consensus across thousands, millions of people buying, selling goods, exporting, importing in US dollar or in euros. Those people reach out a consensus about the price of the pair. And disruption in the financial markets, volatility in the financial market, comes when there's lack of equilibrium between supply and demand. So right now, there's absolutely no equilibrium with those uh, cryptocurrencies. So I think I answered all the questions on the Q&A. Asma is asking, Asma Hassan, if we talk about the dynamic in Qatar and the GCC region, what do you think is the kickoff strategy for adoption in industry, supply chain, and healthcare? So here, I'm going to leave the floor. Mohamed Al Jafari or Mohamed Al Delaimi, they're going to be much more equipped than me to answer this question. Uh, yes, hello, Professor. Thank you for your great efforts and uh, everyone as well uh, for the questions. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. Uh, so, which question you are referring to? The question from Asma Hassan. Yeah, Asma Hassan. If we take, if we talk about the dynamic in Qatar GCC region, what do you think kickoff strategy to adoption industry? Uh, so, in healthcare, uh, I think healthcare is an interesting uh, uh, place to 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 dig in and to do more research about. Uh, uh, especially uh, when people take a specific drug or vaccines, for example, medications, checkups. Uh, most of people, when they go to different uh, parties to do different uh, assessments, uh, so sometimes the government doesn't uh, uh, accept uh, other uh, hospitals' uh, uh, assessments. So uh, the reason why they think they might have uh, different information or wrong information here where uh, blockchain can play a big role in healthcare. Uh, the same concept could be applied as well in education where people go and uh, have a different uh, degrees globally. So uh, usually they ask them for uh, a verification from uh, governments uh, if he has attended those classes or the, the, the rank of the university and the government uh, uh, port arrival checkups and and at et etc. So uh, that's my that's my answer to the question. Okay, thanks a lot, Mohamed. There's a question from Hand Al Sulaiti. Why some countries like China ban the usage of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Yes, yeah, so this happened in October last year. China uh, made a full ban on. Uh, investment in cryptocurrencies and uh, crypto mining. The official reason was to avoid fraud and money laundering. The real reason was simply to have control on money. And the obvious reason is that you can see the Chinese uh, government right now pushing their own digital yuan currency. So really, they want to have a full control of the inflows and outflows of money from China. China is not uh, the only one. I think Qatar, Oman, in the region have banned as well uh, cryptocurrencies, Egypt, Iraq, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Bangladesh. Some other countries have put some restriction on the abilities for banks to deal with uh, cryptos or prohibiting crypto exchanges. In the region, I think you have uh, also Bahrain, Bolivia as well has done the same. Reason always is, okay, and here I'm going to answer the second question as well. In a crypto world, countries cannot control things like inflation through their monetary policy. You cannot have a monetary policy anymore 
if you have a higher adoption rate in a crypto money compared to the money created by a central bank. People might say, okay, well, what's the point about having cryptos if you cannot control the monetary policy? Well, precisely, that's what the libertarians behind cryptos want to do. They want to say, we don't want the central banks to control, to have any monetary policy, to control the evolution of money, to control inflation, etc. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, question from Elias. We can hear recently some information talking about Russia and China will stop trading using US dollars. How this can affect the world economy and does this affect as well negatively on crypto? Yes, that's a big threat on the dollar. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but China is making definitely a big push to have the yuan being the standard, the currency used not just to buy their goods, but as well to be the benchmark for the other goods like oil, like gold, etc. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. It might take decades, but definitely this is a threat for other currencies. And similarly, cryptocurrencies could be a threat to the yuan, to the dollar, to the euro. Dan Raj is asking, what would be new jobs in the future related to blockchain and crypto? For me, I think the main jobs are not on the financial side, but more on the tech side. People who do understand how to build a blockchain, that's what we need. You don't need to build everything from basic. A lot of companies, one of them, for example, is Alibaba. You know, Alibaba is a Chinese firm. It has a subsidiary, a big financial subsidiary called Ant Financial. And Financial has built a system, they call it, I'm going to put the name in the chat, B-A-S-S, meaning Blockchain as a Service. If you go to the website of Ant Financial, the English version, you can see they propose to business people, to developers, to use their code for blockchain but which you can implement into your own system. So people coding the overall framework for the blockchain and not just simple blockchain like currency token, but also smart contract blockchains for you to apply to use into your system. So it's not like you have to start everything from zero. You can start a blockchain from zero. I did it with a group of students that was quite fun. I could send you the code. You can very easily in C++ or in Python, if you know a bit of programming, you can by yourself create a small blockchain, a small blockchain protocol. If you have a bit of oriented object programming knowledge, it's not too difficult, but you don't need to do it from scratch. It's similarly to if you want to develop a website, people would say, okay, you need to code HTML, but in practice, if you want to develop a new website, you're going to use a system like a WordPress where you have all the toolboxes. Well, BASS, Blockchain as a service is a system developed by companies like Ant Financials along you. You need to be a programmer. You need to be a programmer, but you, you don't need to roll up your sleeve completely. All the basic tools are prepared for you. So answering your question, Dan Raj, what would be new jobs in the future related to blockchain and crypto? Definitely programming jobs. So that's what my students at the Master in Finance, I tell them the thing you need to do, the thing we're not teaching you guys because you can do it by yourself. You can buy books. You can have some very good tutorials on YouTube. Learn how to program. Maybe you're not going to program yourself, but you're going to need to speak to engineers who program. You need to be able to speak their language. So you need to learn about programming in, in C Sharp, in Python, in other languages. Fabrice Frédéric is asking, I have recently heard stories about unscrupulous people doing crypto rug pulling where investors made significant losses. Can you explain briefly what this phenomenon is all about? Okay, specifically in the world of NFT, it's really scams like it happened in many other areas before. This uh, rug pulling, pulling the carpet, pulling the rug, it's about getting a lot of people excited about something, they buy into it, and then the people disappear. There are stories almost every day about this big buzz about NFTs. People get you excited about ownership of digital images. Super cool. Well, you think it has no value, but then you see, okay, you can buy those digital images of monkeys for 100 euros. And you see that some people sell them back for 2,000 euros. So you see, that's cool. Hey, I'm going to buy as well a picture of a cool monkey, a digital picture for 100 euros, and I can sell it back tomorrow for 2,000 euros. And then they, they make the price higher and higher. So you see transactions at uh, 10,000, 50,000 euros. 
So here you can get super excited. You say, okay, well, I can make 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 100 to 1 return if I buy into this thing. You buy into it, they get a lot of people to buy into it, and then they pull the carpet, they pull the rug, as the expression you used, Frederick, rug pulling, the system disappeared. It's complete fraud, right? Unfortunately, like in a, any new area, there's a lot of scam. So you need to be very careful. Get excited about the technology, but be very careful about the so-called investment. Okay, Professor, so if we could just take the last question. Sure. Yes. Uh, so uh, the last question is, will crypto networks or crypto exchanges replace Visa and MasterCard networks? Ultimately, yes, we are not there yet. Visa can process 70,000 transactions per second on a Visa network. So we are not there yet in terms of speed of the system. But new generation like multi-layering cryptocurrencies are going to hello, hopefully, but we are not there yet. Okay, Professor, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. For everybody else, we'll be sending you uh, an email tomorrow morning with the professor's presentation and any other documents that he'd like to share with you. Thank you so much. Sure. So I'm going to share this basic presentation I was using today and as well as the two others which are more detailed so you can have a look later on. Okay. And Again, I'd like to say a big thank you for Sabrine and uh, Patricia and the whole uh, HC Qatar team to organize because it's a subject I like to share with my students. And as well, that's the spirit of HEC. We like to share as well information with people outside of our community of people who are on campus, either in Paris or in our office in Qatar. So we are super happy to interact with you guys and so happy to see so many people joining us today. Thank you. We're going to end the session now. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.